be in here. They actually are here to welcome our speaker when his time lands, and they were going to keep him company until his time could come in. But we got a call at noon saying the uh, U.S. DOT Secretary Fox and Plain could not land because of the weather. So he's headed back to Washington. But we're awfully lucky that Secretary Tata has graciously agreed to step up and give our keynote address today. So we thank you so much, Secretary Tata. You'll hear more about him in a minute. Senator Raven, thank you again for being here. I'd like to thank our sponsors for today. Our presenting sponsors are AT&T, as always, and Duke Power. Thank you, John and John. We really appreciate that. Our platinum sponsors are Bow for Baby Infrastructure, LS3P, McGladry, New Hanover Regional Medical Center, Piedmont Natural Gas, PPD, the North Carolina State Ports Authority, Star News, UNCW, Williford Houston and Company, Wilmington Business Journal, and Wilmington International Airport. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Pathfinder Wealth Consulting, Andrew Consulting Engineers, Cape Fear Community College, First Citizens Bank, McGuire Woods, Merkison Taylor & Gibson, Newbridge Bank, and WM Jordan Company. And our silver sponsors, Bridge Terminal Transport, Delaney Radiology, and First Bank. Please join me in a round of applause and thank you. Now to introduce our 2013 Chamber Chairman Hal Kitchen. You hear me say every year that I get to work with some of the best leaders in the world, and this year was no exception. 2013 was no exception. In fact, it's a hot point for me. Hal Kitchen is an attorney with McGuire Woods. He's smart. He sees nuances that I didn't even know exist. Um, I joke with him that the brain of the University of South Carolina graduates is just not quite the same as one from UNC or Head Scholar. Let's yeah. <laughs> say go Hills right now. <laughs> His expe expectations are high, but the support he provides makes you want to work harder than you ever thought you could. Working with him has made me a better chamber exec. I'm proud of our work this year, work led by the incredible chairman, Hal Kitchen. reiterate one thing Tom just said and that was go Hills. <laughs> uh, good afternoon and thank you to each one of you for coming out today. In particular, thank you to Duke Energy and at and for your leadership in the community by being presenting sponsors for us here today. When we were here in April of last year, I told you about some then recent job growth figures which contained some bad news about one. While the nation as a whole has experienced consistent job growth every month between September 2010 and July 2012, 29 of the nation's 372 metro areas had actually fallen short of job growth goals during each one of those 22 months. And our metro area was on that list. Then, last September, we got some more bad news. As you know, gross domestic product, the measure of inflation-adjusted total output, is commonly used as an indicator of economic growth. In September, we learned that, at least according to the federal government, the Wilmington metro area's GDP actually fell in 2012 as compared to 2011. As you all know, when the GDP contraction happens on the national level, they call it a recession. Now, this data from the federal government reflects only the Fed's assessment of our local economy through the end of 2012. I think we all sense, and many of us are even seeing in our own businesses, that the local economy is, in fact, improving. And economists are telling us that the local economy should continue to grow by about 2% this year. So, lagging job growth, stagnant overall local economy, why am I telling you all this? It's not because I want to ruin your lunch. Instead, I'm telling you this because it shows why, now more than ever, we as a community must be committed to create an environment 
where job creation and prosperity is promoted, not hindered. That was your chamber's guiding mission in 2013. And here are a few ways we approach the challenge. If you've been reading the newspaper or watching television recently, you've probably seen that there is an effort underway to revise the county's special use permit process. This is the process that applies when a new business wants to do business on land in the county that has already been zoned industrial. Over the last 18 months, we've heard from businesses, business recruiters, site selectors, and other stakeholders that the special use permit process in place put there by the county back in 2011 has resulted in unintended consequences which make it less likely that new businesses will relocate here and more difficult for existing businesses to expand here. In particular, we are told that under the current ordinance, decision makers often cannot tell whether their business must obtain a special use permit and, if it must, then they cannot determine what sort of information they'll be required to submit and how long the process will take. This kind of uncertainty is a big problem. Most new businesses looking to relocate here have many other choices. When comparing Wilmington to other potential locations, the risk and uncertainty associated with each site is a major factor. Land use permitting processes, like our special use permit process, which do not clearly define what an applicant will have to provide, and which does not have a clearly defined time limit, makes any site less attractive to a relocating company. Likewise, when a business already in our community is looking to expand, often the local facility will be competing internally with other facilities within the same company. Here again, an unclear land use permitting process adds risk to a potential expansion here and makes choosing Wilmington over other locations a more difficult choice to make. So, your chamber has taken the lead in proposing revisions to the special use permit process, along with Wilmington Business Development and the Coalition for Economic Advancement, as well as other stakeholders. We have worked with county leaders, county staff, to make this process more objective and easier to understand. These current efforts are not intended to do away with the permit, but instead to make it more clear and more useful. The planning board held a workshop, a hearing on this, and just yesterday, county staff created another revision, which we are still reviewing. We expect the planning board to make a decision on March 6th. This is an important issue for the future of our community. If you'd like a more detailed briefing, or if you're willing to help us out on this important issue, please contact either me or Connie. The Chamber's 2013 public policy agenda identified the development of a coordinated regional vision for economic development as a proactive step to spur growth. The last year's annual meeting, our keynote speaker, Jay Garner, explain what modern-day site selectors look for in communities. After hearing his remarks, our county commissioners hired Jay's firm to conduct an assessment of our region's economic development strengths and weaknesses. Jay's team has been hard at work since August. Many of you have participated in that process, whether through online surveys or through focus group meetings. Your chamber has been actively participating in each step of this process as a member of the project's steering committee. Jay's report should be released late next month. Based on his work so far, we believe that his report will be direct, honest, and thought-provoking. It may tell us some things we want to do, and it will probably tell us some things we don't. Either way, it will then be up to us, the business community, to work with our elected representatives and other stakeholders to take the report and turn it into positive action. In your chamber, with your help, will lead the way. Another sign of progress over the last year is in the area of entrepreneurship. Last summer, the UNC Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship hired a new director and moved off campus and into a more visible location on College Road. 
Chancellor Gary Miller and his leadership team have demonstrated the university's commitment to public and private partnerships by making a large investment in this facility. The center is open for business and right now is already host to 14 young businesses which the university believes have already created about 30 new jobs. The Revitalized Center is a good example of how your chamber works to involve our business community in economic development. As part of the Chamber's Cape Fear Future Initiative, the Chamber has raised approximately $120,000 in commitments specifically designated to support the Center. In particular, the community owes its thanks to bb and George and Sylvia Roundtree, and McKim McCree for their support through the Chamber and Cape Fear Future. Now, at the BB&T check presentation, BB&T market president, Charlie Maddox, Charlie Maddox. He's, there he is, Charlie. Charlie Maddox said the following, and I quote, he said, this collaborative effort will ignite the spark that will help to positively move our community forward and help us become a leader, not only in creative ideas, but also small business formation and job creation for many years. That's well said and I agree. And that's the spirit of collaboration and cooperation that defines Cape Your Future, which is the Chamber's community building initiative. Cape Your Future, a strategic plan is focused on three areas, entrepreneurship, STEM education, and quality of life enhancements. Now last year, Cape Your Future's education efforts were focused in the area of STEM education. And specifically, we focused on starting and funding a special STEM curriculum at Crass Middle School called Project Lead the Way. Since August, two classes of sixth graders have been able to take a gateway to technology program which introduces them to technology, engineering, robotics, energy, and computer modeling. By the way, this is the same program that was recently cited by the Harvard Graduate School of Education as a model for the 21st century. Uh, career and technical education. Our public education system needs to help kids develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills. For a select number of students in the Project Lead the Way program at Trask Middle School, that goal is closer to being realized. We've been told that the school system is interested in continuing to build out Project Lead the Way by expanding it to other middle schools within the system. Take your future and your chamber, support that effort, and we'll urge our county leaders to make sound, proven STEM education a budgetary priority. Communities which provide superior amenities will attract and attain, retain the best talent and entrepreneurs, and will be the places where many companies choose to relocate. And cities around the world have taken this approach to heart, and the theory even has garnered its own term now. Placemaking. Here in Wilmington, we have opportunities to put placemaking to work for us and we made it a hard place for the future. One placemaking amenity that could help take Wilmington to the next level would be a signature park like those found in Charleston and Savannah. The Chamber has, for years, if not decades, been a proponent of such park. And so we congratulate the city on its recent purchase of seven acres just north of here for future use as a riverfront park. If done correctly, the new park will be a great event, not only for us, but for generations of Wilmingtonians to come. Cape Fear Future and the Chamber will help the business community have a strong voice as the city moves forward with its planning for this unique asset. So that's a quick overview of some of the Chamber's higher profile public policy initiatives for 2013. Ricky Godwin, the new chair, is going to discuss some others, particularly with respect to reducing crime. In addition to these policy initiatives, rest assured that the Chamber's traditional programs and services, and those of the Chamber Foundation, are continuing. For example, now our 2014 Leadership Wilmington class is made up of 30 aspiring and accomplished community leaders who are continuing their educational sessions as well as planning this year's Work on Wilmington program, which will take place on May 3rd. This one-day community service event 
sponsored by the Chamber and the Chamber Foundation and organized by our leadership at Wilmington, attracts an average of 2,000 volunteers who work on projects at area schools, nonprofits, and in public spaces. Projects that might not be completed otherwise. Provide member education. The Chamber has hosted several seminars and briefings over the course of the last year. Seminar topics have included the Affordable Care Act and workplace safety. Uh, we were given a transportation briefing by uh, our honored speaker, um, just announced honored speaker, uh, Secretary Taylor. Um, and we've also received briefings from the North Carolina Chamber on legislative action and how it uh, pertains to, uh, to private business in the state. The Chamber also helped to organize and market the Commerce Secretary Decker's listening to her stop here in Wilmington back in December. At your seat, you'll find a copy of the Chamber Year in Review. Take a look at this document. Uh, it'll show you how your money and our time was spent over the course of the last year. If you like what I see, what you see, don't hesitate to tell us. If you don't like what you see, don't hesitate to tell Connie and Rick. <laughs> Finally, let me express my appreciation to some folks who have made my job as your chamber chair a little bit easier. First, I'd like to uh, thank Connie and her entire staff for all their hard work. Uh, last year was a time of transition and change, and the chamber staff did a great job of responding positively to the challenges uh, that they faced, including some challenges posed by sometimes difficult leadership. Second, I want to thank my fellow board members who will be recognized a little bit later. These folks donate their time in addition to their money to further the interests of business and commerce here in Wilmington. Their support over the past year was a key factor in the progress that I hope you will agree we've made. And now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to your 2014 Chamber Chair, Ricky Godwin. Ricky. Ricky is a partner at McLadry, a provider of assurance, tax, and consulting services with almost 7,000 employees in 75 cities nationwide. He obtained his BS in accounting from ECU and has 25 years of experience providing tax compliance and advisory services to corporations, partnerships, and LLCs. Ricky is one of McLabry's leaders in tax services for the Wilmington location. In addition to his chamber duties, Ricky serves on the board of directors for the Landfall Foundation, the New Hanover County Community Foundation, and the Community Boys and Girls Clubs. He also serves on the UNCW MSA Accounting Advisory Board. Ricky. I am very pleased to present this gavel to you in recognition of the 2014 chairmanship of the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce. serve as the board chair of 2014 and thank you for such a capable board um, to serve with. Any perspective each member brings to the table will serve the chamber and our community well. I'd like to introduce the board members. So board members, as I call your name, would you please stand and remain standing until we call everyone. And if, uh, if your guests will please hold your applause for everyone who's been called. Officers, officers for 2014 are Chris Bowling, first vice chair with LS3D. Mitch Lamb, second vice chair with First Citizen Bank. Charlie Maddox, treasurer with DBNT. Hal Kitchen, immediate past chair of McGuire Woods LLP. And our other board members are Corey Barber, Wells Fargo Bank. Wilma Daniels with Daniels Management. John Elliott with Duke Energy. John Gisdick, New Hanover Region Medical Center. Vivian Jones, WM Jordan Company. Rob Kaiser, Greater Wilmington Business <coughs> Journal. Bill Keene with Invista. John Lyon, AT&T North Carolina. Connie Majorette with the Wilmington Chamber. 
Carl Marshburn paid for the Riverboats Inc. Paul McCombie with Newbridge Bank. Will Purvis Liberty Healthcare. Chris Reed, Thomas Construction, LLP, LLC. Margaret Robinson, Cape Fear Community College Foundation. Dallas Romanowski, Cornerstone Advisory Partners. Margaret, Mary Margaret Van, Parkway of Wilmington. Jason Wheeler, Pathfinder Wealth Consulting. Christopher White, G. Hitachi Nuclear Engineer. Lee Williams, Lime Oak Bank. And Alan Zimmer with Reach Jewelry. Ex officio board members, Jonathan Barfield, Member County Commissioners. Clark Hip, Wilmington Downtown Inc. Dr. Tim Markley, New Hampshire County Schools. Gail McCloskey, Pleasure Island Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Gary Miller, UNCW. Hank Miller, Riceville Beach Chamber of Commerce. Mary Bill Sappho, City of Wilmington. Dr. Ted Spring, Cape Community College. Let's thank them for all their time. We are proud to announce that we're in the final stages of forming what will be called the Chairman's Committee. The committee will consist of individuals who were handpicked for their leadership and sales ability. They, along with the Chamber Board, will be the primary responsible for all the fundraising for the Chamber this year. Funds will be raised by recruiting new members, selling event sponsorships, and advertising space. The committee has the most important job ahead of them. We are grateful that they have accepted this challenge. I'd like to recognize the members 2014 Chairman's Committee. Also, please stand as I call your name and remain standing until everyone's called. And again, hold your applause for the end of Brian Hartzell, Bank of the Ozarks. Eric Wamia, BBMT. Jerry Bug, Greater Wilmington Business Journal. Leon Cruzan, New Bridge Bank. Peter Jensen, PPD. Davis Petrino, Plantation Building Board. Rob Gerlach, Transformational Leadership Coaching Consultant. R. Elmore, start, starting with me. Jeremy Dickinson, First Citizen Bank and Trust. Vince Brewer, Park Sterling Bank. April Aranalo, Duke Energy. Mary Eichelberg, Wells Fargo Bank. April O'Connor, Rico Americas Corporation. Rick DiCrescenta, Al Alliance Credit Union. Alex Hines, Seco Staffing. J.D. Caps with Nick Lodgery. Scott Chetty, First Bank. Jerry Coleman, CW Properties. And Jackie Reynolds, SunTrust. We ask that you will please support them as they call on you this year for fundraising for the chamber. Let's give them a hand off to them. Have recounted a number of initiatives for change in 2013. I'd like to share with you a few of the items we will work on in 2014. On January the 22nd, we had an event called Crime Hurts Kids and Business, where we explain how crime in our community can affect economic development and opportunities to lower the risk that our young people will end up, in, end up involved in illegal activities. An area's crime rate is prime consideration where we locate new business and startups. It could be the reason the next PPD or GE chooses our area or decides not to choose our area. It's also a quality of life issue. We want all our employees, our families, our possessions, and our businesses to be safe. Through discussions with our, with our district attorney, local law enforcement others, we learned that, and it's surprising as it may seem, that one of the roots of crime is summer breaks from school. In the summer months, children from low-income households fall behind their education, while those in the middle and upper-income families regress. The lower-income students can lose as much as two months of reading skills, while others advance one month or more. This trend, we refer to as summer slippage, continues each summer, year after year, until the gap in reading and math achievement achievement is years apart for the students. The result, lower income students may drop out of school and turn to crime as a means of survive because of the poor job prospects. In an effort to combat summer slippage, the chamber is seeking donations to fund a summer program for students living in the youth enrichment zone, which is roughly the area between uh, 4th and 14th streets. The youth enrichment zone summer initiative will be piloted this year with 60 7th and 8th grade students that demonstrate a high need have at-risk behaviors and are underperforming, underperforming academically. For five weeks this summer, the students will participate in the Building Educated Leaders for Life, or BEL, a program at D.C. Virgo Preparatory Academy. BEL's programs are proven to boost student achievement and narrow the achievement gap. 
Academic instruction in the morning will be reinforced by hands-on enrichment classes in the afternoons. To help raise $75,000 for this program, Wilmington attorney George Roundtree has donated $10,000, and John Monty with Monty Construction Corp. has donated $5,000. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> have been raised through donations. If you're interested in supporting this program, if you could, we have place a pledge sheet in your seat. There will be a chamber staff member at the door. You can turn that in as you leave the uh, program. As a part of our economic development strategies, we often look at communities across the country to study best practices. Charleston, as Howard references, is one of those we always look at as a good resource. One best practice developed by the chamber, by their chamber, and the regional development alliances is the economic scorecard. scorecard. The scorecard is an annual assessment of their three county regions' economic progress compared to six summer metro areas and two leading economies. It provides the region's business, governmental community, and academic leaders with unbiased data to help focus collective efforts to address their weaknesses and maintain positive momentum. We believe that our region could use this type of objective data annually to see how our performance in women compares to other surrounding communities. Currently, we are in the initial stages of learning as much about how Charleston developed their scorecard, including how they decided to use the data they include, why they omitted data, um, not, not included in their scorecard, um, the cost, how they paid for it, who else put it together, and even more. We are also studying scorecards from other communities as alternatives also. The scorecard will be a publication for the community, and as such, we will be seeking input as the project moves forward, and likely some help in compiling the data determining the metrics that we use to maximize the scorecard usefulness to everyone, and even the time of the year to publish the report. There will be much more to come on, the, come on this in weeks ahead, and so stay tuned for that. This month, Wilmington received an accolade as being the best city with young artists under 25 outside of New York City. The article mainly noted the opportunities provided by Wilmington being the new film and television home. This is a telling reminder of how important the film industry is to our community, outside of just the amount of funds it brings us. It is clear that film incentives have played a key role in significant film industry growth in our community. The Chamber will continue to work to ensure that our legislators understand that film is a unique business and that without the incentives, <coughs> movies and television shows will move elsewhere. Infrastructure issues continue to be a mainstay of our Chamber's work. We will continue to be involved in discussions regarding building a third crossing over the Cape Fear River. The recession gave us a small reprieve with gross slogan from the county. This is the promise not going away on its own. Traffic congestion on the bridge will grow, so will grow worse, so a solution has to be solved. Al mentioned that a park will be developed next door. There's another big change coming next door. The long-awaited convention center hotel that will be just outside the doors will begin construction shortly. The chamber has been a long time proponent, perhaps the longest, dating back to the 1940s in support of building a convention center. The center has already seen great success and has been a true asset for the groups of old conventions, expos, and meetings like I watch today. The hotel is the last piece of the puzzle to maximize its utility. When visiting the chamber, however, over the next year or so, you will no doubt encounter some parking issues due to the hotel construction. The chamber parking lot will be reconfigured. And we are working closely with the city to develop the easiest process for those coming students. In closing, I'd like to build on the message how began with this comment. We live in a great region with enviable assets. There are a lot of good things going on here, but we can't come from places and think that because we have a desirable quality of life, that we don't have to compete for jobs, recruit new businesses, and keep those businesses that are <coughs> already here happy. We have some economic growth issues, unemployment issues. And we have a bit of, reputation, bit of a reputation for not being particularly friendly to business. Those are items that we need to address for the sake of our regional prosperity. With your help, the Chamber will continue to do so, working alongside other economic groups, local governments, business leaders, and concerned citizens. Being here today, you have shown your interest in the well-being of the area's business community and our region as a whole. I thank you for that and look forward to your continued support. We will update you throughout the year on our progress and likely ask for your feedback again. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Secretary Tata. Um, Tony Tata was appointed Secretary of the Mokan Department of Transportation in January 2013 by Governor 
Governor Pat McCorm, Secretary Tata, a West Point graduate, retired in 2009 from the U.S. Army as a Brigadier General after 28 years of service to our nation. While in the military, he led the development and implementation of infrastructure projects in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan Macedonia, Kosovo, Croatia, Bosnia, and the Philippines. After his military career, he continued his public service and education, first as Chief Operating Officer of the Washington, D.C. Public Schools, and then as Superintendent of the Wake County School System. He now leads a department with an annual budget of more than $4 billion and over 12,000 employees. <coughs> Please join me in welcoming Secretary Tony Taylor. Thanks, uh, Ricky. Uh, it is Tata. I've been called worse four-letter words. Uh, you know, I, I was coming down here um, Yesterday I made a decision when I heard that Secretary Fox was going to be here to meet with uh, the Secretary beforehand with uh, Senator Reagan and some others. And I thought, there's no way that he's not going to show. Um, and, and then um, Connie asked my assistant if I would be the backup if Fox didn't show. And I said, sure, he'll, he'll be there. No, Wilman's a great place, people are great all that and so um, that I thought there would be nothing that would keep the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary from Wilmington with all of the assets that he has and, and how wonderful the people are in Wilmington and so as I left my house in Cary this morning under the threat of severe tornado watch <laughs> and the rain was sluicing off of my windows as I was driving and doing 360s on I-40, I said, I must get to Wilmington. And, and it never occurred to me that the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary would not show. But onward, Wilmington was my clarion call. And so... The North Carolina Department of Transportation is here for Wilmington. And, and truly, it is a privilege. Uh, I'm here once a month uh, for Ports Authority board meetings, and uh, I, I love the, the, the city, uh, the people uh, coming here, going to Riceville Beach. Uh, and, and my wife and I love coming down here. And truly, um, this is a great place to be and so even the opportunity to be the backup speaker really I was just walking down the street to get a cheeseburger and Connie screamed Fox is canceled you know can somebody speak and so you know I came in here but um, uh, what I would like to do is give you an update on where we are on some things in transportation in the state um, you know the governor's given me a charge uh, to uh, redo the equity formula. We did that with the help of Senator Raven, Raven's leadership of Senator Raven, really uh, getting that through the Senate and the House, 44 to 5 in the Senate, 105 to 7 in the House. It's a new law that uh, objectively uh, looks at transportation projects across the state at a statewide, regional, and di uh, division level, and it uh, appropriates the money uh, accordingly based upon need. And I can tell you as I drove through uh, Wilmington uh, from an undisclosed location where I was early this morning, um, the, the, uh, uh, which has a beach and waves, and, and um, I, I can tell you the traffic is bad here in Wilmington and there are needs in Wilmington. Um, but um, so implementation of that law that was passed last uh, July 1st, or uh, put into effect last July 1st, um, is a primary focus of the Department of Transportation this year. Uh, right now we are, we have scored all the old projects, so you have this 10-year uh, list of projects, and we have taken all the data that the General Assembly has approved, and we have rescored those projects under the new guidelines. Between now and, and March, 
uh, rural and metropolitan planning organizations can submit new projects and they will be scored. And then we put them all together and those that are competing for the statewide tier, the regional tier, this is Division Three, which is paired with Division Two, which is a region, and then the division tier. And there's different pots of money uh, in each one, and uh, projects will compete better at different levels based upon really what we're trying to do with the project. If it's a new intersection, it's probably a division project. If it's a major U.S. highway, it's probably a state project, and something in between is probably a regional project. So uh, implementation of that law uh, with fidelity and transparency to make sure that we continue to earn the trust of the people and the intent of the law is to take politics out of the transportation business. That is really my number one priority this year. Uh, so probably number two priority uh, or equal is the governor's 25 year uh, vision for infrastructure and I've probably had 10 different sessions with the governor on this and, and every time we, we move it a little closer. What I can tell you about this region, there's a lot in that vision. You've got the ports, you've got connectivity between here and Charlotte and Nashville uh, that we're looking at, uh, both rail and highway. Uh, you've got the uh, military uh, aspect of, of the military ammunition terminal, Matsu, down at the Sunny Point there, and, and uh, uh, the uh, movement from Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune uh, in this region uh, through the port, uh, and we want to elevate that business. Obviously, I was there when the governor came down there, you know, Jeff Miles said, hey, we've run some howitzers for you. There were six cannons getting ready to move somewhere. Well, we would like to have a lot more uh, of that business moving through uh, the port. And so there's, there's a, a lot in the uh, strategic vision uh, that uh, the governor wants to do in eastern North Carolina. And, and already the public-private partnerships are are uh, were the first things that we did out of the gate. You know, we've got the wood fuels. Uh, the Viva wood fuels will be building domes on the uh, Wilmington port and we have a refrigeration facility that should break ground within the, the next um, a few months. And once those things begin to happen, uh, that's hundreds of jobs that we're talking about in this, in this area. So that's all part of the vision uh, there. And then, so second priority, and, and really not in any uh, effort order, um, is the 25-year vision implementation of law, 25-year vision. And then what I would say is once we get that new 25-year vision out, we've really got to take a look at how we fund transportation. The motor fuels tax revenue is flatlining. Uh, it may bump up or down, but it's because people are driving more fuel-efficient cars and uh, you know, electric cars, hybrid cars, and so forth. Um, the revenue is not what it should be to sustain or even build the new infrastructure that we need. So that's something that next long session, I think that is a, a fair thing uh, for us to uh, have a proposal uh, with uh, uh, the transportation committees and with the General Assembly to see if we cannot uh, find a way to uh, reform the way we fund transportation projects so we can do more because everywhere I go, I was in Lewisburg, um, up in uh, Franklin County two days ago. They need projects. Here in Wilmington, you need projects. Everywhere I go, every county I go, Sampson County the other day, uh, 24, there was, there's a nine mile stretch of 24 that is two lane. And, you know, do we have the money to do that? And there's literally thousands of projects out there that need to be done and we do not have the money to do them. So it's where do we want that line to fall so that we can do as many projects to bring economic uh, recovery and, and vitalization to uh, the, the region. So, uh, but Wilmington area, uh, New Hanover, Brunswick County uh, are, are key areas all the way up to Carteret um, and, and the 25-year uh, plan for sure. There's a lot in there about that. Uh, then the funding reform and then uh, we continue um, 
DMV reform. And about a year ago, I told my staff, let's start doing Saturday hours. I probably told, told you some of this. And I said, I want to start in March. And they came back with a plan to start in June. I said, no, March starts with an M. And then they came back with a plan to start in April. And I said, no, March starts with an M. So we started with three offices, uh, one in Greenville, one in Raleigh, one in Charlotte. I said, give me one east of 95, and one in between 95 and 85, one west of 85. And now, you know, Wilmington's got a Saturday hour uh, program. And uh, we've served over 33,000 uh, customers, citizens on uh, Saturdays, and that four hours on those Saturdays in 11 months. 33,000 people, which tells you, you know, it's a retail business, it's needed, and we're looking at expanding, and, and also during those expanded hours, so the Saturday hour DMVs, instead of 9 to 5 during the weekday, are 8 to 6, so somebody can try to get in there before or after. Uh, we're introducing, uh, Senator Rayden, we're going to introduce during a short session uh, uh, legislation to allow us to do online renewals. Every state around us does it, so there, there ought to be a way for us to do it. And so that you, you know, the ultimate uh, customer service would be for you to be able to sit at your home in your pajamas and click on the level thing and take the sign test or whatever and uh, get your license mailed to you and you never have to drive the DMV. And it's green because you're not wasting gas to get there which hurts the revenue stream. So, I think that's <laughs> um, so th those are the, uh, the four big things, I would say. Implementation of the new law, 25-year plan, uh, funding reform, and DMV reform. There's a lot going on. Uh, you know, we've got ports, we've got rail, we've got highways, we've got ferries, uh, we've got transit, we've got airports. Got a great airport here, by the way. Again, I couldn't understand why Secretary Fox to <laughs> ILM. But um, so, at the end of the day, um, the governor and I are uh, very much focused on making sure that this region has the infrastructure it needs uh, to uh, execute its uh, economic plan accordingly. And there's a lot of exciting things out there. And I know that there are some things that people want to do, and uh, I've, I've got people talking to me about uh, what can you do to make this project, you know, score better or or do better on the on the new law. And I'm like, hey, you just crunch the numbers, and it will tell us. And and it's and it's different. It's interesting, Senator Raven. It's interesting. I got people coming to talk to me to lobby me about a project, and I'm like, "Well, I mean, I'm gonna plug and chug, and and it'll be where it is, and, and relative to the other needs of the state." And so it's it's a new concept, and and um, you know there there are there is local input at the region and division level, thirty percent at the region, and fifty percent at the uh, division. And, and there's a fair amount of money being spread across the three categories, state, uh, region, and, and division. So um, it's a good law. It's probably going to have some uh, uh, freckles on it initially, but we've got, uh, I think we're working through that, and uh, I'm paying attention to it. Uh, I've got them, uh, you know, I, I, a good example is if a road gets you within a few miles of a major military installation, which gives you more points if you connect to a military installation. You know, where, where do you draw that line between it goes to the front gate or it goes, it's a mile away from the front gate? And you know, I can remember I got a bunch of engineers working for me, total left brain, and they're like, well, it doesn't touch the front gate. And I'm like, well, let's have some expanding zones, okay? If it touches the gate, it gets X point. If it's within a mile, it gets Y. And if it's within five miles, it gets Z. And it's that kind of thing that we're having to work through because there there are some uh, very strategic things that uh, uh, we, we want to make sure that we do because it, uh, it's the new law talks about reducing congestion, um, uh, increasing safety, reducing travel time, 
uh, and enhancing economic competitiveness and connecting military and uh, freight and, and ports and, and other infrastructure um, and, in the best way possible. And those are the criteria that, upon which these uh, uh, projects are scored. And all modes are competing uh, for that same bucket of money, which is insufficient. So I think, um, you know, it's a real privilege for me to be able to talk to you. I've been down here before. I talked at Landfall and I've talked at other venues. And, and uh, I, I just love coming here. And, and uh, you know, even under the threat of, of tornado warning and watch. Um, and and um, it's, it's, it's truly a privilege to represent the governor who knows that I'm doing this. And he wanted me to extend his... Uh, Greetings, and uh, I'm happy to take some questions if that's what the program calls for. If not, uh, I'm happy to go get my cheeseburger or whatever it is that I'm supposed to do. But um, thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you, and best of luck uh, during this uh, new year. speech, but, you know, the appearance of preparedness is half the battle. <laughs> thank you again. For All right, thank you. So when I look back at more than 160 year history of this organization, and see the people who have held this position before me, I'm proud to serve behind you. I invite any of you who are not already actively serving volunteering in the chamber do so today. Thank you for joining us today and have a safe travel.